Hello. The commander, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Major Yao Yakubu. Many are called, but few are chosen. Our next speaker happens to be among the chosen. Major Annie Driscoll and I are pleased to introduce the Alphabo, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Kelly Latimer, who is currently a test pilot for Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit in California. In January of this year, Major Driscoll and I had the opportunity to visit with her in California. Undeniably, her story exemplifies this year's GOE theme of courage, innovation, and resiliency. Major Driscoll will conduct an on-stage interview of Lieutenant Colonel Latimer, where her amazing, remarkable, or stupendous story will be told, which will subsequently be followed by a question and answer session. First, please enjoy this short video with the highlights of her career. Retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Latimer was born in Dover, Delaware in 1964. As a child, she dreamt of becoming an astronaut. She attended the United States Air Force Academy and graduated in 1987 with honors in astronautical engineering. She was then accepted into a master's program at George Washington University, where she earned a master's degree in astronautics. In 1989, Lieutenant Colonel Latimer attended pilot training at Reese Air Force Base in Texas. After graduation, she stayed to serve as a T-38 instructor pilot. During her follow-on tour, she flew C-141s from McCord Air Force Base, Washington, and was then accepted into the Air Force Test Pilot School. Upon graduation, she began test flying on both the C-17 and C-141 aircraft at the 418th Flight Test Squadron at Edwards Air Force Base in California. When the attacks of September 11th happened, Lieutenant Colonel Latimer knew she wanted to get into the fight. She went to fly C-17s back at McCord Air Force Base. After two years of deploying and operational flying, Lieutenant Colonel Latimer was asked to become the commander of the 418th Flight Test Squadron at Edwards Air Force Base. After finishing squadron command, Kelly desired to explore the civilian side of flight testing. Before retiring from the Air Force, she deployed to Iraq, where she advised Iraqi pilots flying combat missions. Upon retirement, Lieutenant Colonel Latimer became the first female test pilot for NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center, flying on the SOFIA project, which is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. She then moved to Boeing as a test pilot for the KC-767, P-8, B-787, B-737, and KC-46 aircraft, and culminated as a chief test pilot for the C-17. Lieutenant Colonel Latimer now works as a test pilot for Virgin Galactic where she flies the White Knight II, the dual fuselage high wing composite aircraft that carries the Spaceship Two. Spaceship Two is a reusable winged spacecraft designed to carry passengers into space. She's a lead 747 test pilot for the Launcher One program, the 747 named Cosmic Girl, which will launch a rocket into space and enable the space market for civilian small satellites. She has flown over 40 aircraft and has an impressive 6,500 hours of flight time. Lieutenant Colonel Latimer is a pioneer test pilot and continues to pave the way for Air Force aviators and women in the field of space and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage the impeccable Lieutenant Colonel Latimer. Right. Welcome to the stage, Kelly. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be here. Uh, as uh, Yao had mentioned, he and I both had an opportunity to go out to uh, California to meet with Kelly, and we had an opportunity to watch a full test mission, which was really an incredible experience. So um, I learned a ton by going out there. So today, the way that we're going to guide this um, 
interview is we're going to quickly go through kind of her career, what shaped her um, to become who she is today. We're going to hit the wave tops of uh, her experience in the Air Force and through Boeing and uh, at NASA. And then we're going to spend a good 15 minutes talking about exactly what she's doing uh, out in California right now with both Virgin Orbit and Virgin Galactic. And she's been kind enough to provide us with some uh, pictures and some videos to kind of further uh, talk <laughs> about these. So we'll spend a good 15 minutes at that and then open it up for question and answers. All right, so uh, if you can kind of just start off with talking to us about um, just who you are, what's guided you to this path, and uh, how you got here. Okay, first I'd like to say um, a big thank you to the Air Command and Staff College and the Gathering of Eagles staff for putting on one of the most amazing weeks I've been a part of. And I am extremely humbled, awed, and just honored to be a part of the uh, other Eagles with me. Their stories have just been probably some of the most inspirational things I have heard. So this week for me has been fantastic. So a big thank you um, for that. So my journey started, um, I'm kind of one of those people that from as long as I can remember knew exactly what I wanted to do. So from the age of, I can't even remember, I knew I always wanted to be an astronaut. Um, so I tell this story that I remember, you know, even before nursery school, and I had seen, you know, probably rocket launches and the Apollo launches and, you know, men on the moon and stuff. I don't remember any one particular thing. I just remember always just being fascinated with that. But I remember before going to nursery school, you know, I was at home watching that little show Romper Room, you know, where they have little kids and stuff, and it was like the Halloween um, episode and these kids come in dressed up and there's this little boy dressed as an astronaut and I was like he can't wear that because that's what I'm going to be you know that should be my outfit for uh, for today so I just remember like that early that that's exactly what uh, what I wanted to do and so um, so growing up I was always good at math and science you know I'm actually one of those weirdos that liked school you know I liked uh, like math and science class I loved sports played a lot of sports but um, you know but I always had this passion that uh, I need to be an astronaut and how do I do it so um, my dad was in the Air Force. I was actually born at Dover Air Force Base Hospital, but then um, we moved out to McCord, and he was out probably by the time I was about two. So I didn't really grow up around the Air Force, but I had those pictures of my dad you know, in the Air Force. I knew a little bit about the military. Um, so when I was uh, getting ready to go to high school in eighth grade, you know, I just went down to the local library and decided, well, it's time to figure this out. So I get out the old Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, it was the biggest one, so I figured that had the most information and looked up astronaut and just started looking up astronauts, who are they, and how do you get to be an astronaut? And it turns out they were all, you know, military test pilots. I'm like, okay, military test pilots, so how do you do that? And it's like, well, you gotta be an officer. I was like, hmm, okay, how do you do that? We gotta get commissioned. Well, what does that mean, you know? And you can go OTS, you can go ROTC, or, you know, you can go to one of the academies. And I grew up in New Jersey, so I knew about, you know, West Point and Annapolis, but I had actually never heard of the Air Force Academy. So I'm going through, I'm like, well, see, if you go to Annapolis, you can go to the Navy or Marines, so maybe West Point, you go to the Air Force the Army, I'm not really sure. So, because the encyclopedia actually didn't mention the Air Force Academy. So I go through my whole thing, I'm like, well, I guess I'll try and go to, you know, one of the academies, maybe West Point, um, and then I need to, you know, get my flying time and all that and, you know, be a test pilot and then I can be an astronaut. And then some point a little bit later, like a few months later, I ran over something that said, oh, and here's the, you know, the U.S. Air Force Academy. I'm like, what? They have their own academy? Like, I didn't even know that. This is going to be perfect. So, um, so immediately I get my little typewriter out, you know, and I'm, dear sirs, my name is Kelly Latimer. I'll be attending high school this year, and I'm very interested in going to the Air Force Academy. You know, please send me any information. So I sent off, and then the Academy sent me the entire application package, you know, before I was even in high school. So I had my little package, and I kept it under my bed. I didn't tell my parents. I thought they'd think I was nuts wanting to go to a military academy. So I kind of kept that, and I just sort of, you know, you know, figured out what I needed to do, you know, to be able to go to the Air Force Academy. And by the time I was a sophomore, I'm like, well, I got to figure out who my congressman and senator are. So again, dear sir, you know, my name is Kelly Latimer. I really want to go to the Air Force Academy and I need a nomination. Um, so they sent me their application packages and put the whole thing together. And um, then it finally came time, uh, like going through the process where you have to get a physical. And again, I hadn't told my parents. I just told them, I go, oh yeah, I applied to, you know, like Rensselaer Polytech and Georgia Tech. And I just, you know, I want to be, a, you know, an, an engineer. And I think I want to go in the Air Force and fly. Um, but it came to the point where you actually have to go like to a base and get a physical, you know, so at school day I needed the car. Um, so I finally told my mom, like, yeah, actually I applied to the Air Force Academy and I have to get this physical. And she's like, what? That's fantastic. You know, my dad was like elated. So I had no idea. I thought they'd, they'd try and talk me out of it. But they were elated. So, um, you know, went through the whole process and uh, got accepted. I remember that letter coming in the mail. I got accepted to the Air Force Academy. I'm like, boom, that's it. My career started. You know, now I'm just going to go to the Academy and be a pilot and go to test pilot school and be an astronaut. <laughs> it's as simple as that, folks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's awesome. So uh, you did make it to the Academy then. You started in yep. 1983 uh, yep. and graduated in 1987. 
So at that point, females weren't flying fighter aircraft, and yep. females hadn't attended test pilot school. So, uh, how did you cross that barrier? What um, what kept you going? Yeah, so I talked to you know some of the instructors, especially in the um, you know in the astro department, because they were all up on you know like applying to be an astronaut and that stuff. And so they said the best thing to do would be to get uh, to be a T thirty eight instructor, so you could get high performance time, and then go off and fly you know heavies and get your aircraft commander time, and that will help you be competitive with everybody else who's you know competing for the for the uh, astronaut program. So I was like, all right, that's a good idea. So that was my plan was to go to pilot training and do that. And then I was lucky enough to get a scholarship. So I actually went to grad school right away. And I was kind of in that mode where I really wanted to just go fly and start this whole flying career and stuff. But I also knew that, man, the chance to get a master's degree you paid for, like right now while I'm still in the school mode. So I um, made that decision. So I went to um, George Washington University. It actually was in this cooperative program at NASA Langley. Um, so. I actually worked in the NASA Langley, the spacecraft control branch, and worked with all these incredible engineers that had worked you know, from the Apollo program up through them. I it was like the history of NASA there at Langley. It was incredible. And their computational fluid dynamics programs, I mean, it was just top notch. You know? So I got to, to learn a lot about NASA and have a real appreciation for that entire organization and the research and just the brilliant minds that are there and, and their, their dedication um, you know, to their mission. So I went to, to grad school. Uh, it was a year and a half. And then from there, I went to pilot training. and then. Uh, um, at the time, you didn't, there wasn't, they didn't have the merit assignment system, so you couldn't choose your assignment. Um, so I just basically you know, did the best I could, you know, say be at the top of my class, and um, at least be, it was, it was still FAR TTB, so you had to get FAR in order to, to be an instructor. So I got far and then uh, ended up staying on as the T-38 instructor, so I did that for, um, for three years. That's awesome. And then uh, how did you get into TPS? So, um, so after doing the instructor for, for three years, um, which was a great assignment, and one of the interesting things too I thought was, you know, you come right out of pilot training and then you go right into being an instructor. So for me, I think as far as flying skills and technical and learning um, how to fly and really, really get good at flying, that was probably one of the best assignments that, that I could have done. And the other thing is, um, I was talking earlier about how I'm, I'm really like in high school, I was very quiet. You know what I mean? Like in sports, not so much because I was always competitive and stuff, but like I hated being up in front of the class. I hated speaking in front of the class. I just, you know, never wanted to do it. So if I was like high school, me looking here right now, I would be like, who is that person? You know, I don't even know. And that's one of the things that I think the Air Force um, really did and grew in me was like just being an instructor, you know, up in front of the class, you're instructing students, and it's a place I hated to be, but it made me comfortable doing that. Um, so that was, it was a big growth period, not only in flying, but also in just developing, you know, instructor skills and some leadership skills. Um, so then I went to go fly 141s, and I actually drove through test pilot school on my way and stopped in the office. I was like, hello, I'm Kelly Latimer, and I really want to go to test pilot school, and um, what should I do? You know, I just finished being a T-38 instructor and, and all this stuff, and they said, well, you know, when you get up to your command, just, you know, get as, much, uh, as many upgrades as you can get, as many hours as you can get, you know, as much operational experience as possible. So, I went up to McCord um, and flew C-141s, and that was another, um, like just besides the flying, that for me was like the big growth and the big um, learning period for running a crew, and a crew that's mostly enlisted personnel, a lot of NCOs, a lot of airmen, and that's something at that point I hadn't done because it was all, you know, pilot training is pretty much all officers, and of course, you know, the academy, you don't really see NCOs um, or enlisted members much, so that was a big, for me, I think it was sort of a core development on how you go out with a crew that has anywhere, you're in charge as the captain, and you have anywhere from lieutenant colonel, you know, master sergeant, you know, a baby load who's like a year and a half out of high school that just finished load master training, and how you have this group of, you know, 10, 12, sometimes 15 people, and you're on this mission, you know, and going around the world, and how you handle that. So, um, again, another, another big learning point for me that, uh, um, I just think that the, I think the Air Force is the best and, and one of the most, um, probably one of the places where coming in as a young member, whether you're enlisted or whether you're an officer, that you will get responsibility and the training and the leadership training to take that on as fast as you can handle it versus any other organization you know, that I've been in. So those are big growing years for me, but it also um, let me get on my, you know, my, my tap to get uh, the minimum requirements I needed to go to test pilot school. So I finished up that, and as soon as I had enough hours to have my one year's aircraft commander, I threw my application in. Um, and then they bring you down, they give you a flight eval, and then I got accepted to test pilot school. So I went down there in, um, in 96, so I was class 96B, and uh, went through the year of test pilot school, and I think that was probably the funnest year of my life. We just, we flew everything and anything they would let us fly, and the whole year was about flying. It was challenging, it was a lot of 
engineering work that I hadn't seen since I got my degree. It's kind of funny. You go to school, you know, then you come out of school, and it's you know six or seven years later, and you're looking at equations like, yeah, I used to understand like what to do with these, but um, it's basically just applying all that knowledge um, to flying. So it was just a just a fantastic year. That's awesome. Um, so then you made it through TPS. Spoiler alert: she graduated. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, then 9/11 happened. How did that shape your career? Yeah. So right after, so I graduated, um, graduated TPS, and then I went over to the 418th, and I did test flying on the 141 and C17s. And the C17, what a magnificent machine! Um, and it also gave me appreciation that time of test flying for not um, just the operational mission, but all the engineering that goes into designing an airplane, maintaining it, testing it, modifying it. Um, there's just a host of work that goes from the initial design into flying it. Um, so I got to, so I got my experience in C-17s, 141s, and I was back at, uh, went back on staff at Test Pilot School, and that's when 9/11 happened. So um, the typical career path, you know, when you get to acquisition and you get into the test world, would be to go back to a program office. And uh, once 9/11 ha happened, I was like, no way am I missing this. Like I missed Desert Storm, I missed all of it. And, you know, when you're in the Air Force, you're like, I just want to be part of it. I want to be part of the mission, whether it's just like flying toilet paper to somebody. I don't care. I want to do my piece. I want to do my part. So, um, so you know, which my commander, I'm like, hey, how do I get back and get operational? He's like, well, your career. You know, you really need to go to a program office, and then, you know, you go to school after that. And so I called a friend of mine who was working at personnel. So here's where you do trust personnel people is when they're your friends. So I, so I called my friend who was working, and he was working C-17 assignments, and at the time there was just McCord and Charleston, and there was only 50 C-17s out there, and they were dying for experienced C-17 crews. And he's like, Kelly, I could use you tomorrow. I'm like, all right, we can, we can plan this. Let's strategize. And so we kind of had the strategy and worked it up the chain to have, like, you know, material command, work with mobility command. And, uh, you know, and I got the talk that said, hey, you know, your career, this could really, you know, it's not the normal path, and this could really, you know, tube your career. And I was like, if me going to fly C-17s in Afghanistan tubes my career, then pull out the gun, because it's done. You know, I'm going to go. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so, and, they, and they let me go. And, that, and for me, too, there's a lot of respect to the leadership that listened to me. They listened to what I wanted to do. And, I, I like, and, and they gave me, the, like, the reality, like, here's the situation. And I was like, I want to go get in. I want to fly this thing in theater um, with night, night vision goggles. So... So I went back to, uh, so I got to go back to McCord, which was fun. It's kind of where I'd been before. And I was in the 8th Air Lift Squadron there, and I did a quick mission checkout and stuff. And then pretty soon, you know, I was flying missions into um, Afghanistan. You know, typically for us, we go through Interlick or through, um, uh, through Frankfurt. And uh, one of the key things that getting that operational experience, because everything changed. So, I mean, the whole, like, strategic airlift changed so much after 9-11. It just wasn't the same. When I flew 141s, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're a big crew and you flew around and you did a bunch of stops. When I came back, I mean, everything was pretty much over to one of the stages. It was 24-hour missions at night. Everything was night vision goggles. You were hitting tankers on the way in, landing heavy, coming out, you know, either hitting another tanker on the way back out. But it gave me a lot of experience in night vision goggles and, you know, airlift tactics, uh, which helped me out later when I ended up, you know, working up at, uh, with Boeing. But it also helped when I came back. So after that assignment, it turned out that the... Um, the 418th Flight Test Squadron had come open. That commander was leaving, and um, Material Command didn't have any test pilot school grads that were large aircraft people. And meanwhile, I was now about three years, you know, into my operational uh, tour at McCord. And they go, "Hmm, are you available to come back and be a commander?" You know, I was kind of like, "Wasn't this going to toot my career?" And now you want me to come back and be a commander? So, um, anyways, I was like, "Well, I guess I'm available." So, <laughs> so, um, so I ended up going back down to uh, Edwards. But it was great to be able to get out and get three years of that ops experience, and Iraqi freedom had just happened, so we flew some of the initial missions, you know, into um, Balad and other bases. So I had just come out of that and went into the, uh, you know, taken over as the uh, test squadron commander, and it was great because all these new capabilities that wanted to get fielded were fresh out of what was happening, and I had a knowledge and understanding of where that came from, and so it turned out that that was sort of the new model. It's like, well, now we actually want people to go back and get that op experience, you know, and come back to, to flight tests. So sometimes you never know, you know, when you make, when you make decisions or do something out of the ordinary, that it actually turns out to be you know, a pretty good decision. And sometimes it changes the way other people um, look at managing their folks. Absolutely. So you had a passion to become an astronaut. Um, can you kind of talk through um, how you kept after that goal? Yep. So, um, so, when I first, uh, so when I finished test pilot school and I started doing my test flying, that's the first time where I had the MIN requirements to actually apply. You know, so I got that first application out, you know, sent it into NASA. And, uh, and I got called for an interview. So just as Dr. Bluford had talked about, it's this week-long, basically, physical and psychological eval. Um, so I got called in for that interview, uh, went through the whole week, 
And then it's interesting because there's this whole process that happens um, after your interview. And everybody, like everybody, all the interviewees, there's usually six weeks of 20, so about 120. We all keep tabs on email of who's doing what. And there's all these little stages. So the first stage is um, if you get the, uh, when, you, when, you, when you finish, if you get a background check, that means you're in like the next list. And so my neighbors were like, hey, Kelly, someone came over and asked me about you. I'm like, yes, you know, I made the next step. And so I pretty much came down to, we're like, no kidding. The next phone call was like, you're going to be an astronaut or you're not. And you got a call from one of three people. If you got a call from the medical office, that was bad. You got disqualified. If you got a call from the head of the um, astronaut office, that was good. You're an astronaut. And if you got a call from the selection office, you passed everything but didn't get selected. So anyways, I, I got to, so a bunch of the guys that had all applied, because we were at Edwards, we're all test pilots. Everybody wanted to be astronauts. So you know, I get down from a flight, and someone goes, hey, I hear that you know, Ford just got the call. He's going to be an astronaut. I'm like, what? I'm going back to my desk. I say, hey, Kelly, you got a message. You need to call the selection office. I was like, oh. So I passed everything, but I just didn't get selected. You know, but it was my first time applying, and I thought, that's OK. You know, I'm back here on staff now. I get some more high performance time. Um, but at the time, they had picked this huge class of astronauts, 40-some. And then this class was like 19. And then they were going through like budget overruns, you know, cutting down on shuttle flights. And so they canceled the next um, interview, which was two years later. And they didn't know when they were going to have another one. So I'm starting to think, oh, this is never going to happen. And that's about the time 9-11 happened. So I went back operational, and I was happy to do that. And then while I was out operational, um, you know, I see a little news clip. Hey, NASA's going to do a selection again this next year. So I you know, pull out the old application, blow off the dust, update it with my stuff, and send it in. And so I got called down a second time. And this time, I actually was uh, deployed to Bagram. So I was on the ground at Bagram. I was working at the CJTF-180. I was the mobility component of the, the ACE cell there which also was probably one of the most rewarding jobs and eye-opening and learning experiences was, you know, working right there um, with the Joint Command, you know, at Bagram and basically being that airlift conduit, you know, calling back to, um, to get airlift missions shifted or changed. And um, that's one of the things uh, with the chief had talked earlier about, you know, one, one of the things, you know, in leadership is credibility. And so me, that was a huge lesson in the credibility because you're there as the, the, the one focal for mobility, and, and everybody coming to me, everything was a crisis all the time. So I had to be that filter. I can't call up and say everything's a crisis, because everything wasn't a crisis. Maybe to each person there it was a crisis, but it wasn't really. So you have to be able to filter out, like, what is a crisis? So I had to, I had to know who was credible when they were coming to me, and there was, about, there was two people that if they came and said, we have a problem, I'm like, drop everything, what do you need, because I know you got a problem. A lot of other people, there was always a big problem, and you had to kind of sort through. But the same way, when I was calling up for something, I knew I had to be that credible person when I said, hey, we have a problem. We need to fix it right now. I know it's going to be a hassle to swap these loads, but you need to get the ammo on that fifth airplane up to the first airplane, do whatever it takes, and get that in here now, and we'll sort out the rest. And you can make those things happen. So just having that ability to you know, do that coordination was really incredible. Anyway, so I was there doing that, and I pulled up my AOL email one night, and it's like, the astronaut selection office, hey, Kelly, we'd like to bring you out for an interview. You know, we're going to do interviews again this year until December. And I actually was going to be in theater until December. Um, so anyway, and talked with the staff there again. And again, great leadership helped me out. They knew I needed to get back for a week. So I hopped on a C-17 up to Frankfurt. And then NASA flew me from Frankfurt to Houston. I ran into like the local clothing store and said, OK, I need outfits. I got five days. I need business clothes. It's all physical. I need easy on, easy off, and one interview outfit, mix and match, and a pair of shoes. And the ladies were like, Psh -sh -sh -sh. Got me hooked up, so paid the credit card. I had my week long of uh, clothes. Went through the whole interview again that time. Packed up the clothes, shipped it to my sister. Got back on the plane, and you know went back into theater. Uh, and, and unfortunately, this time the phone call I got was, "Hey, you got a message to call the medical office." And so it turns out that I've got this blood reading of antibodies that's disqualifying, and it's one of those where it's like it'll never change. There's nothing you can do, and you're just never going to be an astronaut. And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> that was." crushing, you know, after this whole lifetime of like, you know, pursuing this goal and trying to do it. And I just, you know, got so close twice. I'm like, so it's just never going to happen, you know. So it was, it's a lot to digest, you know. It was just sort of surreal for a while. And then uh, what's, what's funny is after you sort of, you know, get like the crushing blow gone, like this is never going to happen, it also is a little kind of a sense of relief. Like I had just been like kind of building this resume for my whole life, right, trying to do this thing and trying to prove myself. And finally I felt like, Oh, I can stop doing that for a while. Like, what do I, like, if I could just do anything, you know, what is it, what is it that I really want to do? You know, and I was like, well, I just want to get paid to fly and learn how to surf. So, <laughs> so this is, and so, and so I, I came back and took over as the, as the, and this is about the time I was coming back to take over, you know, as, as the commander. So I'm like, well, I'm going to obviously finish out my 20 years. And then 
And then it was after all that happened that the opportunity to be a commander came up. And I, and I had never really, like when I had you know, planned out my career and stuff, I had never really planned the command path, right? I had planned that whole pilot, you know, test pilot, go be an astronaut stuff. And so being a commander actually wasn't something that I had sought out. You know, and suddenly here it was in my lap. I was like, no way would I turn down, you know, being like, like a flying squadron commander. Like there's just, there's, I mean, wow, how did this drop into my lap to be able to do this? Um, so I, you know, so that, that two years was probably the most challenging and the most rewarding two years that, that I could have ever had. You know, for me, being the not wanting to be up front, not wanting to be, you know, out there all the time, I mean, you're just forced and you have to do it. You know, you have to do it for your unit, you have to do it for your people. Um, so just, it was incredibly challenging for me, but again, it's probably the most rewarding because it's one of those jobs as a squadron commander, it's probably the time you have the most impact on the people that are directly working for you. I mean, you know everybody in that squadron. You know their histories, you know that they're, they're passed forward, you know their families, I mean, you know everything. Um, so it's, it's a demanding job because it's a 24 hour a day job. You can't just, you, you don't just let it go. Um, but that was probably, yeah, and anybody here is going to command, you know, it's just gonna be intimidating. And that, and that first year, I remember that first year, I just felt like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I suck at this. I just don't know what I'm doing. And then, and then somewhere about six months into it, you start to pick up steam. And then that second year, you actually feel like you know what you're doing and you're, you're making changes and stuff. And like all of us, you're probably you know, harder on yourself at the beginning. But you, know, you, really, you really pick it up. And that second year for me was just, you know, everything came together. And it was just, just a fantastic time. If you can pass one lesson then from your commands, uh, what would it be? So I think the hardest thing about command, so I'm a very positive person, right? So I'm, I'm easy to be that cheerleader and let's go and let's get your career going and what do you need and how do we put people in for rewards and do all that stuff. I mean, that's all great. The hardest thing and the thing you have to do, again, to be credible and to be trustworthy is the non-performers. You know, you, you have to take care of those problems and it is not, it's not easy for me. It's not easy for me to sit down with someone and give them bad feedback. Like, you know, flying, if we're doing a sortie, I can do it. You know, we came back, all right, the ride's an unsat, I hooked you in, here's why. You know, because for me it's very technical, but when you get to people's lives and their careers and you have to either, you know, deal out some discipline or deal out the, we're not going to put you in for this information, it is hard to do, but everybody in that unit knows who the non-performers are, and if you let them slide by, if you let them, you know, get rewarded with everybody else, everybody sees that, it takes away your credibility when you're rewarding somebody for a good job. So. That to me is just probably the biggest thing is you need to, you need to handle the, the non-performance and the problems as well as all your superstars. Awesome. Uh, so you finished up command uh, yep. and then um, your Air Force career uh, came up to retirement. Yeah, so I did, I did one more. I did, so just before I left, I did the Iraqi deployment, which that was, that was interesting. So I you know, finished up command and stuff, and, and I liked deploying. I didn't, I didn't mind at all. I actually found being in theater, I liked it because you could get stuff done. Things were quick and easy. There isn't this big staff. It's like, you need something, you call this person, and it's done. So I was like, I, tell, I, go, I got six more months. I'm like, I don't mind deploying. You know, what do you got? And they go, oh, we have this position. You know, it's an, an advisor to the Iraqi Air Force. I'm like, oh, okay, sounds like some kind of a staff job or something. You know, I don't know, like advising the staff on whatever. And there was no more information, just here's the thing, you know, get your mobility pack, get your training, go shoot the gun and, you know, get on this, you know, be at the airport at this time and go. So the guy I'm replacing calls me, he goes, yeah, they tell you about this job? I'm like, no, I just know it's an advisor of the Iraqi Air Force, I'm not sure what that means. He goes, well, you're actually like, you're in the Iraqi squadron. I'm like, oh, no, I didn't, like in the squadron, what does that mean? He goes, well, we're here at Basra and they have a squadron and they basically live on base in these, like a little trailer park essentially. And you actually live with them and fly with them. Like, oh, well, what do we fly? He's like, well, he's a little single engine prop. You know, one of them is kind of a pusher prop, tail dragger. And so, yes, I was a test pilot. I flew a lot of stuff, but like not little airplanes, you know? And I'm like, I'm not going to go make a fool of myself. So to prep for that, I called a friend of mine. His nickname is Bubba. So I called Bubba, who's got a bunch of airplanes. I'm like, Bubba, I need tail dragger time. and I need it now. I'm going to Iraq to fly with these guys. And tail dragger, I have no idea. So Bubba, you know, sticks me in his airplane. We go, we do some, you know, crow hopping a couple times down the runway. Then I finally figure out the tail wheel, front wheel landing thing, get that down. And then I go in theater and it was just, I mean, it was really interesting because obviously there weren't any women, you know, it's an Iraqi squadron um, and it's all guys. And um, so it was, a, it was a little, it was a little uncomfortable at first. I mean, it's just, it was obviously weird. So I got there and I flew with a squadron commander and he was very good. He said, and they, and they just called me Colonel Kelly. He's like, Colonel Kelly, I told, you know, I, I pulled all the, the guys in and told them that we're gonna treat you like our sister from America, you know, who's here to help us. So you're, you're our sister, you know, and that's how we're gonna treat you. I was like, that's great. 
So I flew with him and the other coalition pilots, um, got checked out, and then once I got qualified, it's like I wasn't on the schedule to fly with anybody, you know? So it's like, hmm, he goes, oh, well, we had to, you know, th this change, and then you know, I wasn't on the schedule again, and then, so Magoo was the other pilot, and so Magoo and I, I'm like, well, let's go talk to him. It's like, hey, you need to put her on the schedule with somebody. So they kind of had two crops. There was the really senior guys that had flown MiGs and IL-76s, then there's the guys that had gone to like a basic pilot training and probably hadn't flown anything in like five years. And so I flew with like the brand new young guys, you know, but then it's like anything. Once they fly with you and you're just like, you do the brief, you walk out, they see you can fly, you give them some instruction, help them get better. Suddenly it was like cool to fly with Colonel Kelly and so everyone's flying with me and taking selfies and, you know, so then I was just like, but then, then I was like, you know, the sister that was there to help them. But for a while they were sort of like, yeah, not really sure. But then, you know, once you kind of break the ice and stuff, it's just like any other, any other flying organization, everybody wants to fly. So, so I did that, yeah, before I retired. So speaking of that then, uh, I mean, in multiple different organizations, when you went to the academy, there weren't a lot of females. When you went through pilot training, there weren't a lot of females. TPS, not a lot of females. Again, Iraqi, uh, your Iraqi tour, uh, and then at NASA being the first female test pilot. How, um, how did you approach that? Yeah, I just, I mean, after a while, it's just like a, it's a normal thing. I mean, when I first went to the academy, I knew there wasn't that many women. You know, there's only a couple in my class. Then as you go to engineering, you know, there's even less. And when you get to flying, so it just, um, I mean, the, the thing was, you know, you, you always know that you stand out, right? Like, here's the whole, like, here's the whole classroom. It's all guys and everything. And you come walking in, everyone's like, oh, you know, like, there's the girl, you know. So you kind of know that you stand out, you know, and you're sort of, and for me, like, you know, being the shy person initially, you know, I was like, oh, I just hate this. And, you know, but I just, it just every time I go in, I'm just like, take a deep breath. Take the training, do your best, and just don't worry about it. You know, so that's kind of how I approached it each time. And then after a while, it's just—I mean, it's like a normal thing. But at the beginning, it was just sort of that. Don't worry about it. Just do your best. Take the training. It'll all be fine. Awesome. Uh, can you talk to you how you ended up at NASA, and then how that linked to you getting to Virgin Galactic? Yeah. So, um, so I was getting, so I was retiring, and uh, you know, when you retire, I had a bunch of terminal leave. And so I was kind of looking at my options, and so I was getting ready to retire, big career, you know, did the commander tour in Iraq, and I was kind of ready for a break. Um, and NASA, had a, they were driving at the time, had a job open, and I had applied on a job that had opened some years earlier, you know, and it was just, it was NASA Dryden, you know, it's just the legacy there, um, you know, all the X-planes they've flown, like just super research on aerospace vehicles. Um, so, I, so I applied there for a job, but at the same time I was thinking, yeah, I just want to get paid to fly and live at the beach and surf. So I started looking at other applications, and, and one of my other options was, you know, I could work for Cathay Pacific and live in Hong Kong or fly around the world. So for me, there's always this temptation to want to go to, like, what is your comfort zone, right? Like, what would be easy and comfortable for me? And that would be just some basic flying job where I get one airplane and I fly it, I know what I'm doing, get paid to do it, then I got time to do, you know, other stuff in my free time. And then there's the other side of me that's always looking for that next thing out there that could be really exciting to be a part of. So anyways, I'm going through this whole thing. So NASA you know, offers me the job you know, at Dryden, and I was like, well, no way I'm going to say no to that. I'll you know, take the job and then see how it goes. Um, and of course, fantastic organization. So I got to fly their SOFIA um, test project, and that's a 747, a shortened version that has a telescope in the back. You know, the door opens, they fly up to 41,000 feet, and you know, take a look at all these um, astronomy events all around the world. Um, and, and the big, the reason, they put it on the 7.4s because once you get above 41,000 feet, you get rid of about 98% of the humidity. So this infrared telescope can get above almost all the humidity just by going to 41,000 feet, and it's a lot cheaper than putting it on a satellite and putting it up in space. Um, so that was the project that I flew. So I did the initial, after the aircraft was modified, we did the initial testing um, for that airplane. And then I think I hit, you know, NASA a little bit of a slump in their aerodynamic um, testing. Because that, that, that airplane, so we tested that, and then it was getting ready to go down for about a two-year mod. And then there wasn't really much else going on. They had a little bit of environmental science. They were bringing on some global hawks and predators and getting into some UAV. And, and, and meanwhile, I had lived out at Edwards in the desert, in various deserts for like 10 years. Um, and I really, I just driving into the gate one day thinking, why did I think I could do this for 10 more years? I don't think I can. So I called a friend of mine that worked at Boeing because I knew Long Beach C-17s had a job open. And meanwhile, Boeing had the 7-8 coming on, the 7-4-8 and all these exciting programs. Um, so I ended up, uh, you know, taking a job down at, um, down at Long Beach on the C-17, and then that experience put me into the, um, all the tanker programs, so the KC-767, and then eventually the KC-46. And what's important about that is the, the one part I loved about, so when I got to be a contractor, I mostly worked in military stuff because that was my background. And when you develop weapon systems, you know, in the Air Force, we would test them, you know, test new things. 
but it was always the contractor that did the actual design. And usually by the time I got to the military to test, I mean, the design was kind of fixed. So if you want to change it by then, good luck. I mean, it's, it's not easy to do. And so for the first time, I was the chance we were actually sitting there designing the cockpit, and nobody on that team had night vision goggle experience. And the airplane was going to be, you know, NVG compatible from a receiver, NVG compatible from flying up front. So, um, so what I loved was the chance to actually have some impact on the, how, that, how the, the flight deck was designed, how we did the lighting um, for the refueling in the back, and use all that ops experience that I got. So again, it was that ops experience I got because I kind of didn't follow the conventional path and, and jumped off and you know, wanted, to, wanted, to get into, wanted to get into the war. So anyway, so I did that flying for, um, for about eight years or so. And I actually hadn't thought too much about, you know what I mean? I thought a little bit about the Virgin Galactic. I knew it was out there, but I also was pretty skeptical about it. You know, I thought, hmm, I don't know, like the passenger to space, the little vehicle, spaceship, I'm not really sure. And then they had um, like the, the tragic accident where they lost a pilot, lost a vehicle um, late 2014. And in my mind, I thought, I think that's the end of the, the company. I don't think they're going to come back from that and survive. So anyways, so forward to 2015, um, I get a call from one of my friends who's a pilot down there. And he goes, hey, Kelly, I don't know if you really thought about Virgin Galactic. And you know, in the back of my mind, I'm still like, well, I actually was thinking about it. I just didn't you know, really act on it or do anything. And he's like, he goes, we are regrouping, and we're picking up, and we're moving forward. He goes, we're going to hire two more test pilots. And if you're at all interested, um, you know, let me know. We'll come down and give you an informal tour of what's going on. So, um, so I came down. It was a, so I just took a Friday off work. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I just went down there. And uh, they showed me around, and I was just odd at the organization they were setting up. So after they had the accident, they basically, you know, Scale Composite was the designer of the aircraft, and the original plan was Scale was design the aircraft, um, you know, build it, do all the testing, and then basically throw it over the fence, and Virgin Galactic would catch it and be the operator. So after the accident, um, Virgin Galactic doubled down and said, no, we're going to own this whole thing from beginning to end. So thank you very much. We're going to take it from here. And they built up an entire test organization, a control room from the ground up. And you know, I was part of that cadre they brought in is bringing in you know, test professionals um, to set up an entire test program. So that was 2015. And uh, um, we'll probably show a short video here in a second. But, um, We've actually got to where we've done the first two powered flights um, of the, the new vehicle. So we call it, it's, so Spaceship 2 is, is the actual spaceship, and White Knight 2 is the carrier aircraft. Um, so, anyway, so, yeah, so, I, so I took the job with them, moved down to, um, moved down to Mojave, and uh, yeah, it's probably a good time probably to show the, well, let me just, let me just see what's going to happen in the video. So when, we, when you test a vehicle, you always start from the beginning. So for, for the spaceship, basically, it gets hooked on to White Knight 2. So, You'll see in the video, White Knight 2 is this dual fuselage airplane. The spaceship hooks up in the middle, and you fly it up um, to, depending on how heavy the spaceship is, 50,000 feet or 47,000 feet, and then drop it. So for testing, we would drop the spaceship, and then go a little bit faster each time. So first, you clear the envelope for a very slow speed controllability. Then we drop it. They shove the nose down. They go a little bit faster. Eventually, you can't get that fast, and so you need to, to light the rocket to get the speeds. So, um, so in April, we had our first actual 30-second rocket lights. And then just day before yesterday, we had the second 30-second uh, rocket light, which was a huge deal. So if you want to go ahead and show the video, I'll talk you a little bit through it. And we fly everything out of Mojave. So there you see, so White Knight is basically the dual fuselage, and then the spaceship is... Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next test flight of Unity. A little bit about today's flight. Obviously, the flight last month uh, was a great step forward for the program. Uh, to recap on crew assignments, we have Dave Mackay as pilot in command on Spaceship 2, Mark Forgesuki in the right-hand seat. On White Knight 2, we have CJ Sturco, Nicola Pacelli, and flight test engineer Colin Bennett. So there you see the vehicle taken off. So for the White Knight, everything is in the, the right fuselage. That left fuselage is actually empty. There's nothing in it but a little bit of ballast. So if you see, there's kind of like, looks like windows on both sides. Actually, the windows on the left are just painted. There's nothing in there. So both pilots, yeah, just to make it look cool. So both pilots um, sit on the right uh, fuselage next to each other. And then we have a flight test engineer in the back. And then for spaceship, it's two pilots side by side. And here, I think they're dropping around 47,500 feet. And then you light the rocket immediately. And so for the actual space shot, this rocket light will be 60 seconds. And you pretty much turn the corner immediately and go vertical. And on this flight, they got a maximum of uh, 1.9 Mach, and they went up to 114,000 feet. And so for the full duration burn, the expectation is we'll get up to 340,000 feet. 
And then for the passenger ride, once you hit that point and the rocket shuts off, you go zero gravity. So the passenger in the back at that point will be able to unstrap and actually float around. And there's you know windows across the top. Um, we have a, uh, a uh, reaction jet system that uses pneumatic pressurized air. We can control the vehicle when we're out of the atmosphere. We basically turn the vehicle so it's upside down so they continue to go up. And here's the reentry. Uh, what's interesting is we basically fold those booms 90 degrees up, so the airplane comes down, you know, sort of like uh, like a like a like a badminton birdie, where basically no matter what attitude you're in, the atmosphere will eventually ride it, so you always come down the correct way. And then once you get enough airspeed, you defeather the booms, they come back down, and then you just glide in and come to a landing um, on the runway. Okay, that's good there. So Kelly, can you just recap for everybody what the mission of Virgin Galactic is and what they're trying to do and the, the timeline that they're trying to hit? Yep, so Virgin Galactic, so the mission is basically um, space tourism, is to get let people experience space, is to let people like me that you know, had that dream, that passion to do it, that you're not going to be the, you know, the, the, the two in the next five years that get selected to go, to be able to just experience that. And it's starting at the very initial level. I mean, to get to where you orbit people and you take passengers is difficult. So. Um, the mission of Spaceship Two is basically let people have that, the rocket ride, and you are literally sitting on the rocket. I mean, it is right behind the seat. So you get the rocket ride all the way up. Um, you get the zero gravity for on the order of four and a half, five minutes. You get the curvature of the Earth. You know, you get the the official astronaut altitude, um, and then glide back down. You know, and lands. And it holds. Uh, it's got room for six passengers in the back and two pilots up front. And so the time frame, now that we've got these two burns done, is depending when they look at the data, if they're able to move on, we'll go on to a little bit longer burn. So it may be 40 seconds, it may be 50 seconds. And then after that, um, we go to the full duration burn, which is 60 seconds. And then once we prove we've done that in the reentry, um, we'll do it six more times. And then we have to go through the FAA to get our certifications. So versus like typical military or public use programs, all of our programs are FAA certified, so they actually, the FAA has representatives that sit in in the control room, we do our practice sims, they sit in, we do all of our flights, um, we give them data reviews uh, and all of that, because they're the ones that eventually, right now they gave us a license just for us to go you know, on our own but not take passengers, so the goal is after those six flights, we get the go ahead to take passengers, and then the very first flight with a passenger will be Richard Branson. And that'll probably be out of Las Cruces. Our, our actual operating will be out of Las Cruces, New Mexico. They built a spaceport out there called Spaceport America that operates out of the uh, White Sands Missile Range. And then how widespread do you think this uh, space tourism will be? So right now, so the, so the tickets are not cheap. So the tickets, <laughs> yeah, are on the order. I mean, the, the, the price right now is about $250,000. But we've sold 700 And they actually stopped selling them because we were just trying to get caught up. Um, so I always joke that if you throw my name out, I get you the friends and family rate of 249,000. So <laughs> got that going for you. Um, so, but, but right now we're actually making, so the goal is like, no matter you start any venture, it is expensive, right? It's ridiculously expensive, but that's what it takes to get this started. And there's people out there that are you know, passionate about it, that support it and invest in it um, to make it happen. So we're actually making two more spaceships right now. So the goal is by the end of, we start passenger operations in 2019, by the end of 2019, we'll have three spaceships and one white knight. Then we're going to build a second white knight, three more spaceships. So the goal is when we get to the place where there's actually a whole cadre of these operating, where you're doing you know, space flights almost on a daily basis. At that point, things become affordable and come down. Um, but the biggest thing is just to make it where it actually is affordable and reliable. Um, and that's, that's probably our two biggest goals for getting people to space. Okay, awesome. So uh, Kelly is in charge, uh, or she is a test pilot for this program, but she's also the lead test pilot for another program. Can you tell us about that? Yep, so, this, so when I got hired, so I was the last pilot to get hired, so there's seven. Um, and so the way we're working it right now is, you can tell those flights aren't very long, so to get experience, I mean, the, so the two primary pilots are uh, Mark and Dave, our chief pilot and our lead test pilot. And so they're pretty much the ones that are um, doing all of the envelope expansions for spaceship because every time they fly, they get about 10 minutes of flight time, you know, or 15 minutes. So it takes quite a few flights actually to build up that experience, and only one person gets to land per flight. So, um, so they're, they're pretty much swapping out. And then the next two pilots, uh, and one of them is an ex-shuttle astronaut, CJ Sturkow. So CJ and Such are the next two. So as they get through like a development phase, they'll cycle out of the right seat. So for the rest of us, we swap out every other flight in white night. And so, actually, so the day before yesterday's flight was supposed to be mine from the right seat, but uh, this was more important, so I came out here to do this. And they'll just roll me in next time, so. But, um, so for me, being number seven, um, it's going to be a while, you know, until I get up into spaceships. I'm checked out in white nights, um, and again, you get, uh, you know, you get two pilots in the room, and you'll get five opinions, so. 
there's already enough enough pilot opinion, you know, going on in the development and stuff. So meanwhile, Virgin Galactic had a second program called Launcher One, which is a 747 modified to carry a liquid fueled rocket on the wing, and that liquid fuel rocket will take small satellites into low Earth orbit. And the goal of that is to make affordable launch for small satellites. So, um, so since I had large aircraft experience and I had some time on my hands, um, you know, it's just one of those things where it's an opportunity. So I jumped down there to start, um, you know, to kind of shepherd that program. So right now I'm the lead test pilot for the 747. And, uh, and that facility down there is pretty amazing because both of these, what's interesting is, is the Virgin companies for both Galactic and the second company actually spawned off. It's now called Virgin Orbit, but they're all under Galactic Ventures, which is a big umbrella for all the, the space uh, ventures. Um, but the interesting thing is we do all, as much as we can produce in-house, everything in-house, we can be responsive to ourselves and not rely on outside vendors. So if you're a small company that has a 1Z, 2Z requirement, you usually don't get very good service you know, from other vendors um, and companies. So we do everything in-house. Um, so we're gonna show a video really quick of like the last year for Launcher One. But when I, when I came on that program, it was two years ago, and you'll see a thing of like the factory floor with all these rocket parts and pieces, you know, first and second stages laid out. It was empty when I first got there. There was nothing. It was 100 people, and now there are about 450 people, and we're getting ready to put the first rocket on the airplane in probably a month and a half to test fly it. And I'll talk a little bit more after the, uh, after the video. So again, all the machining, um, all the composite laying, all the tanks, um, all the engine pieces, parts, the avionics, um, everything is built there in-house. We actually have the largest 3D metal printer in the world down there. And the idea of that is if you can 3D metal print you know, things like a nozzle or like complicated parts that require bends and welds and bolts, if you can make that all one piece, you can make it as stronger and much faster. We do all of our engine testing up at Mojave. So you can see the thrust gimbling there. So both the first and second stage, all that testing is at Mojave. This is the airplane. We sent it out to L3 in Waco to get modified. And this is when we flew it into Long Beach, which is where she resides right now. So the left wing got modified structurally to be able to, to hold the rocket. And the profile for that is we pretty much fly the 7-4 up to um, basically uh, 30,000 feet and then pitch it at 35 degrees nose high and then just drop the rocket there. And at that point, the 7-4 is pretty much out of airspeed, so we just, you know, fall off to the side, you know, come down and land, and the rocket drops and five seconds later it goes. And that's the payload up front, so that's the payload fairing that separates to let the payload out. And you'll see here in a second when they show um, outside, they basically did, they've already done, like, this is a full mock-up of the rocket. Basically, it's the first and second stages, you know, minus the engine and then minus the payload up front. And they did, they, they built the entire rocket with all the plumbing and then took it out, hung it as if it's hung on the airplane hooks and did all the uh, fueling and defueling for the locks and the, the RP. And the RP is just rocket propellant. It's basically a, a high-grade kerosene. But there's, the rocket itself is all composite, so it's extremely light. So the rocket is, um, on the order of 5,000 pounds with all the pieces, and then once you put all the locks and fuel in there, it's uh, 58,000 pounds. So pretty much all of it is just all that, the, the liquid fuel um, sitting in the tanks. And so to show a second picture here of the, um, we actually have, we're ready to go with the test rocket. So again, the way we step through it is you're not just gonna put on the airplane and go fly it, but this is pretty much the test rocket that um, we're gonna use. So it has all the tanks there, but they're all empty right now. It's got a mass um, to simulate the rocket engine because we don't want to fly with an actual rocket engine. And it's missing the payload piece in the front, which again, we'll just have a dummy load up there. But when we put this on the airplane for the first time, we're just going to fly it empty. So it's lightweight, we're not worried about loads. And we'll go and just make sure that all of our um, assumptions for like the aerodynamic stability and everything is good to go. And what we've been able to do is um, partner with NASA Ames, and they have a 747 simulator that we have our uh, computational fluid dynamics group go through, and they can run this model on the aircraft, and we've used Boeing to help uh, with our CFD analysis. We've used NASA Ames and Armstrong both to help us with our CFD analysis. And we can actually model how the aircraft flies. We go to the sim, and they put all those parameters in the simulator as if the mass, the weight, and the aerodynamics of the rocket are there. So we can actually go do takeoff landings. So we can do our pitch-up maneuver. We can practice aborts. And then we can actually practice the release maneuver and see how the sudden change and all the aerodynamics and the loss of the weight affects the aircraft. Um, so a couple of tools that are really cool, but that is going to go on the airplane probably middle of July, and we'll fly it, and then we'll come back and we'll fill it up with water, basically water and some baffle balls, and then we'll go fly it as if it's the heavy weighted mass, 
and we'll get um, all of that testing done. And then we'll actually go out um, to one of the ranges and do a practice drop. So we'll drop it once, and if all goes well, the next thing will be putting the actual rocket on, um, you know, fueling it up, and first launch. The, the best case, optimistic, everything goes well, which it never does, would be that we launch sometime, you know, October or so. That's awesome. Can you talk to the price point for these, and then? Uh, yeah, so I told you about the price point for Spaceship 2. It's high, but there's a lot of people out there that can play that price point, so we're pretty much booked for that. The price point for this is right now it's about $12 million for a launch. The goal is to get it down where it's more in the $8 million range. So the idea behind Launcher 1 is to make a platform that is, you know, it's flexible. We can fly it out anywhere. If you have a runway, you know, we can take off and fly there. It's responsive and it's affordable to get small satellites. Um, so right now, since launch is so incredibly expensive, you tend to go with one satellite that does everything and is hugely expensive. You have the option to go quick launch on your schedule for an affordable price. It may change the way that um, that we design satellites or do constellations. Instead of one 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 big satellite, you go with five. You got a little reliability. Um, maybe spread out your targets a little bit. So there's a, it's one of those things where the hope is that if we make it affordable and reliable and responsive, that you know we sort of change the access to space on the commercial side. And is there any engagement with the Department of Defense? There is, yes. We, um, we actually have a, so, so because there is engagement with the Department of Defense, um, to keep it out, like, a little bit separate from the commercial company, we, we have, like, another company we call Vox, and they basically handle um, any customers with, like, special requests or special requirements or any of that type of stuff. So, yeah, there, there is engagement there, and there's a lot of interest. Okay. Awesome. So I know that we're kind of uh, rolling up on time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say we can take one question. Sir, are we... Okay, let's go ahead and uh, we can take field one question if anybody wants to jump up uh, and ask, and then, awesome. We got somebody running to the mic. <laughs> Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Major Smith, Flight 8. Okay. Just want to ask, with all your experience in the Air Force, NASA, and now with private industry, what can the DOD learn from private industry to allow us to innovate better? I think one, one of the things I've learned, you know, seeing like the three different, the, the, all the organizations are very different, right? They come out of kind of a different pedigree. Um, so what I think is interesting is probably the Virgin companies are the ones that are like the leanest and meanest that, I, that I've seen. I mean, they're in, but they're basically startups, right? So um, companies like Boeing tend to get very big, very large. Um, you know, I see the military government as very big, very large, a lot of processes that get put into place over years. And it's always difficult, once a process gets put in place, I think it's very difficult to get rid of that, especially on a large organizational level. Like I remember being in a squadron, there's little things I could change in the squadron to kind of help processes, you know, streamline some things, get rid of some things. But to make bigger changes is very difficult. Um, so I, I feel as though that, like, the, the government and NASA and e even Boeing, I mean, Boeing is, they are good on their, you know, commercial product thing, but they still, in the end, are this big organization. There's still a lot of different, you know, masters to feed when you go through. Then I get to the Virgin companies, and they're small, they're startup, um, and we talk about how we just we hire people um, that'll pick up a shovel. So we may hire like the smartest, you know, aerodynamic person in the world, but if we need someone to go down and, 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 and shove a bolt, you know, into the side of something, then they need to be able to to go do that. Um, and it's amazing how quickly and fastly problems get solved. I mean, every, everybody is there. I mean, there, there isn't like layers of leadership. There's just a couple people. So we hire people that are experts that have this experience across industry. So. Let's take Launcher One. I mean, Flight Operations is literally two people. It's the Director of Flight Ops and me. And so we just, we just run the thing how it's supposed to get run. It's not a huge operation though, right? It's one airplane. So we sort of have that ability to be you know, very small where it's one airplane. And then for me, the challenge is how do we go when we have two 747s or three 747s? And how do we keep ourselves from building these processes that become you know, an encumbrance and, and it just become difficult to change? So. To me, I think that the more you can make the case for you know, getting rid of processes in a way where it makes sense, um, usually the, the better you're going to be and the more efficient you're going to be. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask one last question then. Um, so obviously, you're incredibly driven. Um, and up to this point, you've worked really hard. What have you found that uh, has enabled you to have a work-life balance and ensured your happiness at this point in your life? Um, Good question. I don't know if I have a great <laughs> work-life balance or had it through. I mean, I always, you know, I just was sort of like always on to the next thing, you know, and I always feel like I'm going to take a break. You know, this is going to be, I'm going to take a break. I'm done. And like a little shiny star comes up like, oh, look, that shiny star. I'm going to go do that, you know. So, 
Yeah, so it's been hard. I think I probably, um, I, I think if I look back, there's probably, I just was so, and I need to get all the time I can get, I need to get all the missions I can get, I need to, you know, you know be in there, like as soon as like something's ready for me to go do it, I want to go do it right now. And I think I missed out a lot of things like friends' weddings, you know, when my sister had her kids, like I wasn't at any of that stuff, you know, and I, I look back now, I'm like, it probably would have been fine for me to go do that. And I don't know why, you know, my mind, everything was just so, you've got to do this now and, you know, be on the schedule. And, and I look back and I go, so I didn't really need to, to, to widen that balance. But here I find myself in the program where I'm talking to, you know, Ray, my husband, as of October, um, that, you know, like, like, like coming, yeah, <laughs> getting a little bit of balance. <laughs> Um, so, you know, and I'm like, hey, we need to have time to go do stuff. I'm like, all right, Launcher One's getting ready to fly. Put everything on hold for the next year because I've got to be devoted to this program. And as soon as it's ready to fly, I've got to be there to be ready to fly. So I think I'm not doing a great job at it. I think I'm still, I mean, I'm trying. I know it's like, you know, something that I'll look back on. And I just want to try and not look back and regret missing out on important things, you know, in my family's life um, because of what I'm doing professionally. Because, like I said, like, this, you know, like the flight this week, it's like, there'll be another one. Just, like, go to this event. I'm just, like, I came here in the experience and meeting everybody and being part of this gathering at Eagles has been amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, uh, everybody. I hope you caught all of that. I know both of us speak quickly and we're highly <laughs> caffeinated. So uh, thank you, Ray. Thank you for coming out uh, and enjoying this week with us. And Kelly, thank you so much for uh, your time. Um, thank you for sacrificing a mission to come and be with us and to share your leadership and your insights. So thank you. Right. Thanks. All right. Thank you.